there and um, welcome to the 36th episode of the English Sovereigns podcast with me George Prentice and for the first time a special guest in the form of James Seymour. Uh, hi James. Hello. Hey. Um, James has been my friend for quite a long time. He was at Windsor Boys with me and um, we have quite a lot of good banter. Uh, he's kindly agreed to come on and do uh, the podcast with me with King Henry the Sixth. So, James, um, what can you tell me about King Henry the Sixth's character? Um, so, well, first, as a bit of background, I should probably say that um, my knowledge of Henry the Sixth comes largely from what I wrote about for my course work at History A level. Okay. So, I feel like um, my kind of judgment of him is probably clouded by the critics I read. And um, the conclusion that I came to was that uh, the King Henry VI was one of the like main facilitating reasons for the outbreak of full-blown civil war. Okay. So, um, yeah, one of the, the quotes that have stuck with me, I think, mainly because at the time I didn't really understand a lot of the words, <laughs> but I do now, so that's a good thing. But um, Henry was described as being weak, vacillating, feckless, and profligate, <laughs> which I feel like is a very damning indictment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, yeah, um, and I think maybe that perhaps stems partly from his, um, I think maybe his piety, because uh, he was brought up to be quite pious. And from what I've read, he seems to be, especially in contrast to Henry the Fourth and Henry the Fifth like he seems to be very war averse, like very, very in favor of peace, which I don't know if that explains partly why the War of the Roses is like one of the background reasons. Like, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, so, yeah, I think what you were saying kind of in contrast, especially to Henry V, um, that's definitely like a, a massive just juxtaposition between their mm. kind of how Henry V was seen as this military leader. And then when he died, you have it was some being kind of not really old enough to have any real kind of influence. So you had the, um, the Dukes of Bedford and Gloucester, his uncles, mm -hmm. were yeah. effectively kind of in charge until he was an adult. So he never really had any opportunity to develop any kind of leadership skills. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. I, d I remember reading too about, yeah, he was kind of pulled in two different directions by is it, yeah, Bedford and Gloucester, you say. Yeah, it was like, he, yeah, he never really had the chance to kind of become his own man, which I don't think was was too good. Um, so obviously Henry V had won at Agincourt and basically become king of France or he had extracted from the French. You know, he would, once Charles VI of France died, that Henry would become the next king of France. So when Henry VI came to the throne and Charles died, Henry was also the king of France. Um, but he lost quite a few, I think he basically lost all of his French lands. What do you think this probably had quite a big effect on the War of the Roses as well? Um, so I, I feel like Henry VI didn't really have any of the kind of acumen for military strategy that yeah. his father had, which like, I mean, ultimately, that's kind of what caused this kind of loss of all the, just everything that his father had gained. And I mean, in turn, from what I've read, this led to the kind of mental collapse that he, um, he had. And like, from that point, I mean, previously to that, I think there was definitely some kind of inherent weakness or inability to fulfill that leadership position yeah but i feel like after um he kind of went through that kind of period of um like where he was just in a kind of catatonic state yeah where um richard was able to uh, richard of york mm -hmm. took over as like kind of protector of the realm from that point onwards he didn't really have any sort of authority in order to prevent this um just infighting between well, his wife and then the kind of Yorkist faction as well. Yeah, that's a very good point, especially you mentioning his wife, because I think 
Margaret of Anjou kind of was again like married her much to the chagrin of the nobles of England who were like why are you marrying a French woman when we're literally trying to take over that country um but then she also tends to be quite do what I guess if you go back to the gender stereotypes of the time it's like yeah the king's meant to be the strong guy you know doing all these things and the queen's meant to be the sort of background lady but Margaret of Anjou was basically the opposite um and I think that kind of rubbed up the wrong way and I think maybe lends to what you were just saying earlier the quote about was it Henry being vacillating and and weak um do you would you agree with the characterization that Henry that you kind of said with the quote at the beginning of the podcast um so just kind of in terms of backing some of that up mm. I've read the uh well he, he was criticized at the time for his profligacy in the way that there was this kind of European-wide uh, economic depression going on but he'd spent so much money kind of yeah. investing in the establishment of Eton College where yes, that's right. his, his nobleman believed that <laughs> that money could definitely have been better used somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> then just in terms of kind of his relationships with the, the nobility at the time, there was this, um, well, he was kind of like giving in to what his advisors were telling him, which I, I guess to a point was kind of fair because they had more at least political experience but it got to th this point where his wife was effectively kind of running things in order to favor her own position and kind of the position of their son to take over yeah that's right yeah um that's 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 a very interesting point um i think from there kind of is natural to talk about whether or not you think history has been unkind to Henry. Right. So I, I would say definitely a, a part of it is this kind of the, the contrast with just two successive kings mm. where one was seen as so powerful and just in terms of leadership, in terms of kind of military strategy, he had everything that Henry didn't, but also didn't really have the chance to get. Yeah. So I, I feel like he, he was definitely not necessarily suited for the role, but at the same time, I, I, I guess the way in which history has portrayed him has kind of been very shaded by things that were almost out of his control yeah uh, yeah that's that's a very fair point i think he might have been a better king in the circumstances where you didn't have say english possessions all over france when england was totally at peace he might have been a much better king for that time perhaps um yeah i would say uh as probably maybe a last question um in terms of his popular portrayal um so I'm, I'm talking principally about Shakespeare. Um, how, how do you think that has affected the historical reading of Henry? Well, I feel like kind of outside of people who have like read into like, I say proper historians, I mean, <laughs> I feel Shakespeare, his main kind of purpose was to, to entertain the masses. And yeah, I guess secondarily to that, you've got the kind of, at least in his history plays the the kind of desire to inform. And I, I feel like with the the Henry the Sixth plays especially, you've got this kind of recency bias. So I feel um the like whilst um at least um Elizabeth was on the throne as a descendant of the kind of Lancastrian line. Yeah, exactly. You've got his kind of, um, I mean, I, I feel like he probably had almost a, a more favorable view of Henry, possibly, than some other historians might have been might willing have been to give him. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting point, um, actually. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, I probably should also note here, just, just for the record, uh, Henry was king in non-consecutive terms. Um, he, was actually, he actually reigned for quite a long time, I think, nearly basically 40 years, although on and off. Um, 
And yeah, he was murdered, I think, in the Tower of London in 1471. Um, because I just don't think Edward the Fourth wanted him about. Um, but yeah, I think that is largely it. I mean, we could go into lots of detail about Wars of the Roses, but like that takes a while because it was an extremely long war. So uh, we we won't do that. Um, yeah, I thank you very much for coming on, James. And um, thank you. Yeah, and I will see people next time for episode thirty-seven and King Edward the Fourth. Thanks very much. Goodbye.